Okay, let us begin this session. In English, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, but in our conference, the proof of the nanomaterial is in the treating. So let's figure out what uh, we can achieve with uh, state-of-the-art nanomaterials in, clean, in a clinical context. The first presentation in this session will be given by Dr. Neil Desai, uh, who will talk about uh, phase three studies of Abraxan in the treatment of metastatic melanoma and then advanced pancreatic cancer, which are two of the most devastating states in uh, the progression of cancer you can have. So we are very eager to hear your newest results, your uh, update about your field. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, and it's a pleasure to be here to discuss uh, these uh, recent studies in pancreatic cancer and melanoma. Uh, I don't think I have to introduce the drug, uh, but um, these are studies that have not yet been published. They were just released at uh, large meetings like ASCO and others uh, earlier this year. And uh, as you know, the drug has been approved for breast cancer and for lung cancer in the, uh, relatively recently for lung cancer. Uh, but uh, as Patrick mentioned, two of the, the really tough diseases to go after are pancreatic cancer and metastatic melanoma. And these traditionally uh, have been the graveyards for the development of new drugs, if you look at the history. And uh, these graveyards are littered with uh, the remains of uh, new potential agents. So you have to be very careful when you go after these difficult uh, to treat diseases. So pancreatic cancer, again, uh, five year survival rate is less than 5%. It is the worst survival of any cancer there is. Uh, the standard of care is gemcitabine, which is uh, more of a palliative treatment. And uh, the overall survival typically in the metastatic setting is five to six months. Uh, this is a, a typical patient that you see with uh, pancreatic cancer. Often it is not detected early and the pa uh, patient's already in the metastatic state uh, when they present due to the symptoms. Uh, and uh, there's usually extensive liver or lung metastases and uh, these patients have a very, very poor prognosis. If you look at what has been done in the field of pancreatic cancer over the last 20 years, uh, you may be surprised to find that there's at least, at least 20 different large phase three trials. Uh, and uh, this is just a partial list. And, and in each case, uh, these trials have not succeeded, whether it was to try and combine with the standard of care, which was gemcitabine. Uh, here's some of those results. Uh, essentially, you see that uh, there is no difference between uh, uh, overall survival and the gemcitabine standard of care or even with the novel targeted agents. Uh, and these could be the, like, uh, you know, the erlotinibs and the uh, uh, tififarnib and some of the antibodies, et cetera. So none of these have really shown uh, success in the treatment of pancreatic cancer. The only one in all of these years that did actually uh, have a positive phase three trial was the trial of gemcitabine and erlotinib which is uh, uh, seen here in the green box. Uh, and if you look at the survival improvement, it was 12 days, okay, 12 days over gemcitabine. And despite that, that was approved by the FDA. Of course, it's not used uh, uh, widely in clinical practice because the, the clinical benefit is not that significant and it has uh, additional burden of toxicities. So here's your typical patient uh, with the metastatic uh, disease. And uh, fortunately for us, when we tried NAP, paclitaxel, or abraxane in these patients in our phase two trials, we saw some dramatic responses, and including complete responses in pancreatic cancer, which is not uh, common at all to see in this disease. And this is what spurred us on to, to move to a phase three trial. Uh, so here's the, the phase three trial study. It was called MPACT. And uh, this is a combination study of gemcitabine and napaclitaxel versus the standard of care, which is gemcitabine. And it was led by our PI, who was uh, Dan von Hoff. The trial is uh, 842 patients. So this is the largest pancreatic trial that has ever been, um, phase three trial that has ever been done. Uh, of the combination therapy versus the standard of care. And of course, the, the primary endpoint in this trial was overall survival. 
This was a worldwide trial. Uh, we had uh, 150 sites worldwide in uh, the US and Canada, uh, in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, and in Australia. And it took about uh, three years to accrue, uh, a little under three years to accrue the 860 patients. So uh, I won't get into details of this because of time, but uh, they're well balanced in terms of both arms, in terms of the, the baseline characteristics of all of the patients. So there's a 430 patients in each arm. Uh, so the results, the response rates uh, in the treatment arm, which is uh, napaclitaxel and gemcitabine, is 23% versus the standard of care gemcitabine, which is 7%. And the p-value, because it was a very large trial and highly significant results, is 10 to the minus 10. Uh, whether it was done by independent review of the CT scans by independent panel or whether it was an investigator review. Uh, in which case the p-value was 10 to the minus 16. So highly, highly significant. The overall survival uh, curves, you can see the curves separating nicely uh, right from the beginning, which is an important uh, consideration for pancreatic cancer patients because these, the sickest patients are the ones that are up to the left of this curve. And, uh, and it, these are patients that uh, are essentially dying within the first few months of therapy, and it's nice to see a separation of the curves right in the beginning indicating that you are impacting uh, the, uh, the lives of these very, very sick patients. Uh, the overall survival data is shown here, um, pardon me, uh, so 8.5 versus 6.7 months, uh, so it's about a two-month increase in survival, uh, and while numerically that may not be uh, sound very much uh, in the in, a, in the lifespan of a pancreatic cancer patient who has metastases, this is clinically significant. Uh, if you look at another f uh, way of looking at survival, which is the, the survival at different time points in the study, so at uh, 12 months, uh, you have a survival in the control arm of 22%, and the number of patients that are surviving uh, uh, is increased by about 60% to 35% at 12 months. So 35 patients, 35% uh, of patients are alive at 12 months. Uh, if you look at 24 months, so two years out, uh, you have only 4% of patients in the control arm that are alive. So this is uh, doubling the survival rate to 9%. Again, these numbers are small because the disease, as you know, is very devastating. But this is the first time you've seen a significant improvement in survival in these patients. And so a conclusion of this study is uh, that we are seeing an, a significant clinically meaningful uh, impact of survival uh, in these patients when they're treated with napaclitaxel. Uh, and in particular, if you look at the one-year and two-year survivals, we see a, a, a quite a dramatic increase. And napaclitaxel plus gemcitabine is now considered uh, uh, the new standard of care in this disease. Uh, and we're hoping to get approval, uh, FDA approval, that is, uh, later this year. So I'll switch gears now uh, to malignant melanoma. And once again, uh, like pancreatic cancer, this is a devastating disease. Uh, the five-year survival rate is uh, 16%. And the median survival is typically in the range of 6 to 12 months. And the, the current treatment options until just a couple of years ago were standard chemotherapy, which was dacarbazine uh, and temozolomide, or, or immunotherapy with IL-2. Uh, in the last two years, or year and a half, there have been successful phase 3 studies, which is very good for uh, uh, melanoma patients. In particular, you may be familiar with the BRAF story. So the, the, uh, the patients who have the BRAF mutation uh, are, when treated with vemurafenib, uh, show a very nice result. And then there's an antibody against CTLA-4, which is also proven uh, to be uh, uh, and, and approved now in combination with the standard of care, which is DTIC. So in this trial, we treated 514 patients. And it was a single agent study of napaclitaxel versus the standard of care DTIC. And uh, this study was also started in 2009. Uh, and uh, currently, we have uh, completed the primary endpoint of the study, which was progression free survival. The secondary efficacy endpoint, an important endpoint, is overall survival. We have interim data on overall survival, but the final overall survival data is expected 
uh, hopefully by the end of this year. So again, uh, about 264 patients in each arm. The, both the arms were very well balanced. Uh, as far as the primary endpoint uh, progression-free survival, we saw a rough doubling of progression-free survival from 2.5 months to 4.8 months uh, with a, a good separation of the curves and is statistically significant. Uh, the uh, the uh, planned uh, interim analysis on overall survival, uh, which was a secondary endpoint, we saw also a nice separation of the curves. This data is not fully mature. This is the interim data. Uh, however, there's, it's trending very nicely with an increase in survival, uh, and uh, we hope to see significance in this data later in the year. So uh, what's very interesting is uh, also some subset analyses that were done, uh, which is by the BRAF status of these patients. As you know, a large number of uh, melanoma patients have a mutation in the BRAF. It's called the V600E mutation. And uh, there's a drug specifically approved for this. If we look at uh, the survival in those patients, so this is a smaller subset of 65 and 67 patients, it's very interesting to see that nap paclitaxel actually shows an increase in survival, so about 17 months versus 11 months uh, in this subgroup. So this is something that we would like to study in the future. Uh, and for these patients who have the BRAF mutation, there's additional options so, uh, other than the BRAF inhibitor or even combination studies. So uh, to look at overall survival and compare it with two recently approved regimens, this is the BRAF inhibitor and this is the antibody plus the carbazine. Uh, you see the current uh, overall survival, which is interim data, not the final data, is 12.8 months, and it compares favorably with the 13.6 months and 11.2 months of these two new novel agents which have recently been approved. So in the future, we're looking at studies that combine uh, NAP paclitaxel with either of these agents. And uh, the, uh, the toxicity profile of NAP paclitaxel is such that it will allow good combination with either of these agents. So in conclusions on the melanoma study, we saw a, a doubling of uh, progression-free survival. Uh, the interim overall survival analysis showed a trend in favor of NAP paclitaxel. However, we will get the final data hopefully later this year. And then regardless of BRAF status, uh, the benefits in PFS and overall survival observed in the NAP paclitaxel arm. So taken together, we, uh, this should be also considered as uh, one of the important therapies now for uh, metastatic melanoma. So I think my time's up. I'd like to have some acknowledgments and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I congratulate you to these results, which are very nice. One of the key questions for a patient who has to live a few months is the quality of life in these few months and how, many, how much of the time he spends outside of the hospital. Do you have data or information about the quality of life in uh, the combined treatment versus the standard of care? Yeah, that data has been collected. Uh, I don't have it to present, but uh, I will say this. The, the thing that we've always seen, in particular with pancreatic cancer, is that you get a very fast response to the therapy, which means within two cycles of treatment, which is uh, roughly uh, less than eight weeks, you are seeing a shrinkage of tumor. If there's gonna be a response, it happens very fast. And that is particularly important, as you know, in pancreatic cancer patients, because these patients are really suffering. They're in a lot of pain. Alleviation of pain is typically something we saw and we uh, documented in our phase two studies and it happened very uh, relatively quickly. So from that perspective, the quality of life uh, we feel has been impacted in a positive way, and I think that data will be published uh, later. Yes, please. Um, very beautiful data about the um, uh, benefit of the combination treatment for the BRAF um, mutations. Uh, do you know or can you suggest a mechanism why it is uh, is it taken up preferentially by tumors with this mutation, or what's, what's going well, on? Well, I think, like I said yesterday, if some of you were here, you know, we, uh, you are always learning about your drug, no matter you know, how long it's been. So um, uh, it's very interesting data. And just like we have data in pancreatic cancer with the KRAS mutations, we've seen there that you have a higher, those cells, those cancer cells with the mutation, or have higher uptake of albumin, 
preferentially. We don't know that for BRAF, but it could be something along those lines that is uh, affecting the, the outcome. So this is, again, an area of interesting research that sort of opens up, you know, once you see data like this. Uh, very interesting data, especially for the pancreatic cancer. So uh, it's just out of curiosity if it is not confidential. Um, it is confidential. <laughs> <laughs> so um, concerning the recruitment of the patients for this phase three trial, because you have two arms. One is the standard of care regimen and uh, the nano, nanoparticles. So uh, did you employ uh, a strategy different from that of standard of care regimen in recruiting the patients? Because here we are comparing a solution versus a nano, nanotechnology, which may behave differently uh, when you inject in the, in the blood. So, to, so that the patients, you, can, you selected the patients that can uh, best benefit from your product. No, no, the, the, the importance of this trial is to try, of course, we define the criteria for the patients. They all have to be metastatic. This is not early stage pancreatic cancer. They have to have metastatic sites, at least one metastatic site. So that's one criteria, on, obviously, on both arms of the study. Uh, other than that, there was not real stratification by any subsets. For example, you know, we are interested in spark expression in these patients, but that's a post hoc analysis. We haven't. Stra uh, you know, included patients just with Spark. Or these, are, these are all comers. Uh, I will say this, that uh, during the design of any trial where you have or, um, an agent that is known to be beneficial, or at least the perception of benefit is there, you always have the conflict of those patients that get onto the control arm uh, want to really be on the, the treatment arm. And uh, we face that same benefit, and we are having difficulty in fact, uh, recruiting to the gemcitabine arm. Because once patients get randomized to there, then they say, oh, okay, I wish I was on the other arm. So, but, you know, like uh, any new therapy, you have to push through that and make sure you get your trials completed and uh, educate the patients. And uh, the other strategy in such situations is sometimes you allow crossover. So if the gemcitabine or the control arm doesn't work, then at the end of the, when the patients progress, they are allowed to cross over onto the investigational therapy. So sometimes that gets rid of that uh, issue. Yeah, uh, I mean, you clearly have an effect. Uh, how would you increase the dose, the dose symmetry at the tumor? I asked the question yesterday, how much drug gets there? Can you see a strategy where you would get more drug there and then have a bigger effect? Or is this a uh, few molecules of paclitaxel per albumin always going to be limiting? Well, uh, see, so you, you, I mean, that's a research question, right? Uh, of course, you could, uh, you could do something about a Braxane. There's always avenues to, to improve delivery, right? But uh, this is a commercial product, so we can't tweak it, you know, while we're doing the trial. Uh, the, I, I think the question, it's a, a balance of um, the benefit risk and the dosing that was selected in trial was, took that into account very carefully uh, because these patients are very sick to begin with and you have to take special considerations in the treatment. We have space for discussion at the end of the session, so let's postpone further questions to that 